Just to give some context, I'm currently in the UK, and the town where I live in is known for its drug scene, but doesn't have a violent crime problem to speak of. I think that's why I found what happened so shocking, because I lived in London before, and while some messed up stuff did happen to me there, it was nowhere near the level of what happened to me earlier this year. My partner and I live together in our flat, which is in a relatively busy residential area. I work from home, however, and he's out of the flat quite a lot, so I guess it might look to an outside observer like I live alone. Our flat complex was once an old factory, and we have these huge industrial windows, so people walking on the street have a pretty clear view of our dining room, which is where I work during the day. It all started in July of this year. I'm ashamed to say that I can be a major rubbernecker and a lot of drama occurs on the road outside of our flat, so I look out of the windows often during my workday for some light entertainment. The best was a two-hour breakup I got to watch unfold in the car just below our window, but that's besides the point. One day, I got up to make myself a cup of tea, looked out of the kitchen window, and saw this guy just staring at me. I was struck by how intense it was and how he didn't look away, even when it was obvious that I was looking back at him. I felt creeped out by it uh, and I tried not to let it bother me. We have a lot of drug addicts and other weird characters that hang out around here so it didn't seem like such a big deal. I went back to work and by the time I'd sat down at the table, he was gone. About a week later, my partner had gone to visit his dad for the weekend so... I was excited to hunker down and catch up on some of my favorite shows alone. After about 30 minutes, the buzzer to the flat went. The buzzer is so loud and it scared the heck out of me. I was lucky my popcorn didn't go flying out of my hands. Now our flat complex has this big porch where teenagers and addicts love to hang out because it provides shelter from the rain and about four people can sit down inside of it. Sometimes people lean up on the buzzers by accident when they're hanging out in the porch, so I assumed that was what happened. After a few seconds, however, the buzzer went again, and again, and again. Someone was pressing it in this rhythmic pattern. It's something I know my partner does when he's forgotten his keys, and it's kind of our code for me to let him in, which is why I found it so disconcerting. At first, I was worried he might have missed the bus to his dad's house and had decided to come back to the flat. I was nearly about to buzz him straight in when I thought it would be a good idea to pick up the phone first and check who it was. As soon as I picked up the phone, the person standing near the intercom must have heard because they said, Hello? It was definitely not my partner. I asked who it was and why they were buzzing the flat so late at night, but all they said was, can you let me in? I asked them why they wanted to come in and they said, You invited me, remember? While they were talking, they kept kind of laughing under their breath and the whole exchange put me on edge. I told them I had no idea who they were and just hung up. I was expecting them to start pressing the buzzer again, but they didn't. After a few minutes, I crept out of the flat to have a look at who was on the porch, but they were gone. My partner has to get up early for work, whereas I'm more of a night owl. Most nights, I'm up until about 2am or 3am working on my laptop while he's asleep. A few nights after the intercom incident, I was on my laptop watching YouTube videos and realized that we'd forgotten to take the trash out. This happens a lot and it's not uncommon for me to take the trash out at around 1am or 2am. At least it wasn't until all this happened. I put my slippers on grabbed the bag of trash, and took it out to the curb outside the flat's main entrance. When I looked across the street, there was this guy standing on the opposite street corner. He was watching me, and his eyes followed me all the way from the front door to the curb. I noticed he was smoking, so I assumed he lived in one of the houses across the street. I remember even thinking, wouldn't it be creepy if he tried to come over here? As I put the trash bag down, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and saw him walking in a straight line across the road towards me, with his eyes fixed on me the entire time. I don't know how to describe it, but the look on his face filled me with this instinctive sense of dread. It felt like someone had just turned my stomach inside out. I pulled my keys out of my hoodie pocket, turned around and ran to the front door. 
I've never felt that kind of fear before and it was like my body was compelling me to get as far away from this man as possible. I got into the building, slammed the door behind me and rushed to my flat without looking back. I didn't want to know whether he followed me or not. I told my partner about the whole thing the next day and how shook up I was. We agreed that we'd be more proactive with trash and I've never taken it out late at night again. Fast forward to the beginning of August, about two weeks after the trash incident and I'd pretty much forgotten all about it. I was still too scared to go out late at night on the road but nothing weird had happened since then. I went to bed at about 2am but I felt restless for some reason and struggled to get to sleep. By about 3am I was contemplating whether or not to give up and go do something else when I heard the scream. The sound cut right through me. There was something visceral about the terror in that scream. I knew it was bad because my partner went from stone cold asleep to being up in the shot. He asked me what it was and I said I didn't know. I went to the window straight away and looked out. Down one of the side roads near our flat, I could see headlights, but I couldn't get a clear view of the car. The screaming continued in bursts and after a while, I could make out words. It was a woman and she was saying something like, get out, get out, over and over again. I'm used to hearing all kinds of domestic arguments take place on the road outside of our flat, particularly since we're near the university and several popular bars. But this is different. There was this raw fear in her voice that made the hairs of my arm stand up. I turned to my partner and said I had to call the police. When they picked up and I explained what was happening, they seemed disinterested at first, but the operator's tone changed when I told them where it was. I think they must have been getting calls from all around the area about it. It was sometime during this phone call that I heard a screech of tires and the screaming stopped. The operator asked me to go to the window and describe to them what was happening. When I looked down, there was this black car sat on the road. One of the neighbors from across the road was speaking to the two guys in the car. I had to twist to get a good look at them, but one of the guys in the car looked uncannily like the guy who had been watching me when I was putting out the trash that time. At first, the conversation seemed congenial, but it took a turn when the neighbor asked them some sort of question that I couldn't quite hear clearly and they sped off down the road. With no less than ten minutes, three police cars arrived and had blocked off the roads leading to our flat, a residential area is on a grid system. They were knocking on doors and asking to speak to all of our neighbors. I told my partner that we should go out and speak to them and since we saw a lot of what happened and my partner had had the foresight to write down the license plate of the black car. When we went out, there were these two girls talking to one of the police officers. They were both shaking and one of them looked as though they had been crying. I decided to stand nearby and wait for the girls to finish before speaking with the officer myself. What they said made my blood run cold. They were from one of the houses that looked out directly onto the road where I had seen the headlights, so they had a clear view of what had happened. Like us, they had been alerted by the screaming and gone straight to the window. From what they could gather, the black car had cut off a small red car on the road, like pulled right in front of it, and that's what had caused the girl driving the red car to scream the first time. They thought it might have been some kind of misunderstanding, but then they watched as one of the guys from the black car got out, walked to the red car, and jumped in through the window. That's the point when the girl must have been screaming, get out, get out. There had been a struggle and the girl watching said they assumed the guy was just trying to steal the car, but then he forced the driver into the back seat and that's when he drove off. The two girls were both hysterical by this point and you could tell they felt guilty for not intervening. I could feel that same guilt seeping into my thoughts as well. After the guy had driven off in the red car, the two men in the black car had gone the opposite way and turned the corner onto our road, but had been stopped by another neighbor. Although this neighbor had been alerted by the screaming, he hadn't actually witnessed what happened, so he had stopped the black car to ask the guy what was going on without knowing they were involved, and that was the exchange we saw. When the guy started acting suspicious, he asked him if they would wait for the police to arrive, and that's the point when they took off. It wasn't until we got back to the flat that I started to put two and two together. I have a small red car, just like the one that the girls had described, 
and I normally come back at night on that day of the week since it's the day I go to visit my parents. I had only come back early on this particular occasion because I needed to let a plumber in to do some work on the flat. What if they had been waiting for me, and they had gotten the wrong car? Over the next few days, I contacted the police several times and checked the local news, but I never heard anything about the girl who was kidnapped. I still have no idea what happened to her, and all I know is that they found her car abandoned somewhere not far from where she was taken, but she wasn't in it. It still gives me chills just thinking about it. This happened nearly a decade ago. At the time of this story, I was 15, male, 5'5", and 132 pounds. I was a wrestler, so I always knew my exact weight and kept myself extremely lean, but still had a fairly muscular build. I lived in a fairly small town of about 50 to 60k people, and in my off-season I did whatever I could to be somewhat active and outside. I had a friend, we'll call him Blaze, who was really into disc golf and always asked me to come play with him and smoke a doobie while we were in the more secluded parts of the course. He was a couple years older than me, but no bigger than I was, just not so great of an influence for me at the time. This small town only had two disc golf courses, one at a very public park near a middle school, or one at the edge of town in an older park that was much bigger. Obviously, we weren't smoking for everyone to see. Little did I know on that Thursday afternoon that this park happened to be my town's hotspot for people meeting and hooking up in the parking lot. I live in the Midwest, in the US, so there weren't a lot of like young, stylish, pretty guys. It was mostly guys aged 30 to 50, pretty big and bulky and country looking. So we finished the course in the joint, walking out of the woods, anything but sober. We typically either just chilled in the grass or played catch after we finished up until my buddy was more normal and ready to drive back. We noticed that there were way more cars in the parking lot than we got there, and a lot of older guys sitting on trunks of their cars or on tailgates, loosely grouped together. This very large hairy man in a tank top and his tall, thin friend dressed like a biker gang member started to do the wolf whistle towards me and my friend. I got pretty uncomfortable. Not because a man whistled at me, but because we had to walk in their direction and I could feel the eyes of way more guys on me than I wanted. For a testosterone-filled weight room junkie teenager, I did not feel very safe here knowing that there were at least 30 guys in this group, and I can see in my peripheral that a very large portion were eyeing us closely as we walked towards the parking lot. I'll make it clear that I'm not a fighter, and I would never intend to hurt anyone aside from self-defense, but I was definitely confident in myself to hold someone off. Us two were just so outnumbered and not in a sober state of mind, so anxiety made things much worse. A couple of them said some gross catcall things and more whistles and then woo-woo noises that rednecks like to make when they're excited about something or instigating, similar to woo but if Eric Cartman screeched it. I think they had the idea that we were some people that met online and were coming to meet up. Being high, I didn't care what was going on, I just wanted to be safe and not the center of attention. When we got closer, the big hairy man who did the first wolf whistle said something like, you think you can handle this? And I just mumbled no thanks and tried to keep walking. He yelled back, What was that boy? To which I just said clearly, No thanks. Not into it. He seemed offended and angrily said, Not into what? All I said was, Sorry, I'm not gay. And he seemed to be offended by that word. Again, asking me to repeat myself in a very aggressive tone, so... I corrected myself and said I'm just not into guys. Things escalated from here very quickly. The man stepped forward from leaning against a truck and grabbed my wrist. He said, well, we can fix that real quick. Don't get excited. I didn't do some cool fight move to attack him. Just a simple wrist roll and using that momentum, a quick push of the elbow to turn him around so that he would have his back to me and I could get by without anything more. He responds, touch me like that again and we'll get the both of you. Another guy made his way over to Blaze who was much less the calm and chill type of stoner that I was. 
I can only describe what he did as one of those kicks or sidesteps off of a wall, but to that guy's chest and abdomen. He started to run and yelled F off as loud as possible. Very quickly, bunches of guys began to stand up from their seats on the outside of their cars and motion our direction. I started booking it for the car too, and the Mr. Skinny Biker type man was running right after us. Thank God it was just him running and not multiple chasing us or this story might be different. I was faster than Blaze so I got ahead of him and pictured us running across a parking lot to his truck that was facing us, backed into a stall. I got around to the passenger side quickly with Blaze still about a hundred feet from the truck. He tried to cut to the right and make it to the driver's side of his little S10 but skinny guy cut him off and sent him to the left passenger side. I ran around the back of the truck as fast as I could to the driver door and Blaze slid his keys around the roof towards me. I hopped in, well aware that I did not want to be driving right now in that state of mind, much less in such a crazy situation and even more or less someone else's vehicle. Still without thinking, I started it and skirted out of the parking lot while Skinny banged on the bed of the truck chasing. But that wasn't the end. A truck and a car are on their way right behind me. Skinny jumped into the car that was in the back, and the chase began. Terrified and still high, I cut through the grass of the park to get to the main road more quickly, thinking I would lose them that way. These guys raced over the speed bumps and around the bends in the park road right up to the main road, and they were driving so fast I would have gotten T-boned if I didn't smash the pedal to the floor at the right time. I'm so stressed I started silently crying while driving, thinking of how horrible the possibilities could be. Contact wearers know that when your eyes are dry from the smoke, then they rapidly get moist, contacts tend to drift a bit until they find their place again. This is definitely not ideal for someone with awful vision driving twice the speed limit down a road in the middle of town. So I started turning down residential streets and weaving in and out, being tapped on the shoulder by Blaze to keep my speed up because the two were still right on my rear bumper. I even made some risky U-turns and they followed right along. This chase lasted over 10 minutes of me frantically driving through main streets, residential, back alleys, and everything I could try to get away. I was so scared that the best case scenario ended in us getting pulled over and myself obtaining a permanent record for DUI by the ripe age of 15. Luckily, a stroke of luck and a surprisingly quick reflex came to my aid. Blaze yelled cop and pointed to a parking lot to our left where there was a police cruiser probably just waiting to catch someone speeding or running red lights on the semi-busy road we ended up on. I whipped into the parking lot and parked a couple of stalls down from the cop. The truck prepared to turn but stopped in the middle of the road. So quickly once he realized what was going on that the car followed him had to swerve and pop a curve catching the officer's attention. He backed out and the two vehicles split different ways and were out of sight before he got out of the parking lot. Never went back to that park any time other than the mornings after that. So thankful that nothing bad came out of the incident and we made it out completely unscathed. No idea what they would have done. But people engaging teenagers in a car chase could not have had good intentions in mind. It was my first time in my life being harassed like that too. You would think being in a car chase might be fun or exciting. But I just felt so powerless and like I had no control. Like nothing I could do would both get these guys away from us and simultaneously not get me arrested. It happened last year between Christmas and New Year's Eve. I'm from the French Caribbean, so it's not unusual to scuba dive during Christmas holidays. My family and I, a 25-year-old female, booked a few dives. They're all really good scuba divers, better than me. They passed a few scuba diving levels that allowed them to participate in way more technical dives than I'm allowed to do. I enjoy scuba diving as well, and I'm able to do almost every casual dive, but I don't feel safe diving without an instructor yet, even more if it's a dive with decompression stops required. If anyone isn't familiar with scuba diving, here's a quick explanation. You can dive safely into a certain depth before the pressure becomes dangerous. If you dive below that point, which is roughly 20 meters or 65 feet, 
you have to do decompression stops during your ascent. It means that you have to stop while going back to the surface a certain time to let your body adapt itself to the pressure. If you ride up too quickly, you may catch decompression sickness which can lead, in a worst case scenario, to death. So, we decided that I could manage a little private lesson with my instructor first prior to more exciting dives with my family. So the first day, my family was enjoying a dive on a technical spot that I wasn't feeling up to while I was alone with my instructor and retrieving my old scuba diving reflexes. Everything went okay. We were on a beautiful coral reef. There were many beginners on the boat and I was by far the more experienced here. So finally, my instructor decided that he could manage me with another student, which was truly a beginner, and after a small briefing with every safety rules and hand sign, which is the only way to communicate underwater, we began our descent. I quickly retrieved all of my old reflexes and was enjoying myself, going back and forth to the instructor and the beginner diver during at least 20 minutes. Everything was perfect beside one thing. It was a windy day and there was a heavy swell. It's less of a problem under the water than it is for surface swimmers, the only thing was is that it requires more physical effort to swim and so my air bottle was emptying a little quicker than usual, which was normal. I signed to my instructor that I was running thin of air and he nodded. It was at this level far from being critical. It was at this moment that I saw a young man swimming towards me. It wasn't the instructor, nor its student. I've never seen him before, but he was in full scuba diving gear and we were the only dive boat on the spot so... I assumed he was with us, and I just didn't pay attention to him on the boat. He was swimming fast towards me and then signed me that he was out of air. When an air failure happens in scuba diving, there is a very strict procedure. You have to help the person, no questions asked, because every second is vital. If you faint underwater, you drown. On your gear, you have two breathing devices, regulators, octopus, I'm not sure about the English word, a main device, and a spare device. So I handed the guy my spare breathing device, which means that we both were breathing on my gear, consuming twice as much air as I was consuming alone. I waited till the guy seemed calmed down and tried to hand sign him to go see my instructor. He nodded a no and signed me to start our ascent. I understand this is the procedure. I was a little low on air and above the decompression stop level, so the right thing to do was going up to the surface before having an air failure, but... I've had to tell my instructor first. This guy was very reluctant and it was strange because it would have taken us like 30 seconds to tell the instructor and he would have started an ascent with us. During this time, I was panicking at seeing my own air level going down and I saw that our instructor was staring at us quizzically and swimming towards us. It was at this moment that the guy let go of my spare air device and started swimming away, breathing again in his own breathing device. I was totally lost and started my ascent with my instructor. Once at the surface, because of the tides, I was feeling dizzy and nauseous so my bizarre encounter wasn't the first thing that I debriefed. It was after I calmed down and the boat driving us towards the beach without the strange guy that I asked my instructor about what happened. Uh, I don't know. Maybe a guy who lost his group and needed some time to calm down? They replied. Okay... Why did he tell me that he was out of air, though? My instructor told me that I probably misunderstood his hand signing, that he was probably not telling me he was having an air failure because he left breathing in his own device. I'm sure I saw him do the air failure sign, but it was okay, I guess. The next day, I joined my family during my dive, and the instructor was different. It was a girl this time, Charlie. I've had time to think about that guy, and I was worried about him. So I told everything that happened to Charlie and asked her if she knew the guy and if he was okay because I didn't see him going back to the surface. She asked me to describe him, which I did, and she told me, Oh, that's Marvin. No, don't worry about him. He's preparing himself to become a scuba diving instructor. Every time he has a day off from the restaurant he's working here, he asks us to dive him on the coral reef that morning and to pick him up in the afternoon. I ate at his restaurant this noon and saw him. Don't worry about him. I was feeling relieved and told myself that it was just a comprehension issue with Marvin. The rest of the week went without any incident. 
I was doing more and more technical dives, and everything went very smoothly. Charlie was a wonderful instructor. Never saw Marvin again, that being said, until the last dive. It was on New Year's Eve. We planned the best dive on that day. It was on a shipwreck, and I felt trained enough to try it without any instructor, just my family and I, and it was Charlie's day off. It was fairly deep for a beginner like me, 30 meters at its down point around 98 feet. My first day male instructor was there and told us that he would be exploring the shipwreck too, so we would cross him and he would help me if he saw that I needed it. It was very comforting to know and my family felt comforted too when I told them that, so we began our descent and started swimming around the shipwreck. We crossed our old instructor twice, but every time I signed him that everything was okay. It was at that moment that I saw Marvin swimming toward me. At this moment I was about 5 to 10 meters above my down point, still staying under my decompression stop level though. I was a little surprised, and even more surprised when he signed me again that he was out of air. I was distrustful, but if there was any chance that it would be true, I couldn't not help him, so I handed him my spare breather. But this time I had a lot of air left, so it wasn't really an issue. He took it, started breathing in it, and took my arm. I reached to see his air level instruments, but he prevented me from seeing it. Then he signed me to start an ascent with him. I immediately signed no. I wasn't at my deepest when he reached, but I had been deeper during this time, and I've had a decompression stop to do. I saw that my father saw us, and he quickly looked away, probably not understanding what was going on. I tapped at my diving computer, a device which calculates when and how long to decompress to signify it to him. He shrugged, smiled at me, and started swimming up, still holding me. I was paralyzed for a few seconds, and the thing that helped me react was that my diving computer was telling me to stop and decompress now. I then understood that I was in danger and that if I let him do what he wanted, I would die from the bends. I then started screaming, only to remember that no noise can be heard underwater. I started wriggling frantically as I saw my father and sister way below me, my diving computer alerting me more and more intensely. At that moment, my father saw us and he reacted. He swam very quickly towards us and I managed to hit the guy as my dad grabbed my ankle and suddenly dragged me deeper. The guy then quickly swam away. My dad dragged me deeper again, and then we waited for a very long decompression stop to ensure that I would be okay, then started heading towards the surface very slowly and cautiously. Once we reached the surface, I started crying frantically and went back to the boat. My father then told me that he thought Marvin was my old instructor, and this was why he wasn't surprised at first. I then told it to my old instructor, who took it more seriously this time, and told me to show him Marvin when we would go up to the surface. Thing is, he never did. The next day, on New Year's, we went a last time to the scuba diving club because my little sister had a diploma to collect and we saw Charlie. Still choked up, I told her what happened with Marvin and then she stiffened. She told me that Marvin was at the restaurant yesterday for New Year's Eve and he didn't go scuba diving which means that this guy wasn't Marvin. And to this day, I still don't know who he is, or what he wanted, or why he tried to kill me, maybe twice. About five years ago, I was living at a home with my parents and my twin brothers were there too. Every morning at 7 a.m., we would both head out for a run. We had mapped out this giant loop that we would run. To make it a bit of a competition, I would run it in one direction, and my twin would run in the other direction. That way we could run and stay focused. Part of this loop was on the main street of the city my parents lived in. On this main road, there were these shady apartments kind of hidden by a bunch of trees. The direction I was running... The views of these apartments were skewed by giant hedge bushes and I couldn't see the apartments until I was right in front of them. Out of my peripherals, I see a woman standing among the trees, staring at me. I sort of 
immediately get chills and don't turn to face her because I didn't want to be rude. So I run on and forget about this a few minutes later. I pass my twin about 10 minutes later. He's going in the opposite direction as I was. I get home and my twin isn't back yet so I go about the rest of my morning routine including taking a shower. I get out of the shower and my twin hasn't come back yet and I'm starting to get a little bit worried. An hour after I had gotten home he's still not back and I call him. He tells me he's on his way back and he has something he needs to tell me and my parents. He finally gets home and tells me that as he's running in front of these apartments he saw a woman hanging from the trees in front of this apartment. As soon as it's obvious he sees her, a man comes sprinting from the apartments wailing and screaming, No! I can't believe she did this! and grabs her body and lays her on the ground and starts performing CPR. It was obvious that it was her husband. My brother calls the local police and they dispatch an ambulance and police officers. My brother has to stay for questioning as a witness to this report and the whole process there, and he's obviously troubled by it. Since he was going the opposite way that I was running, he didn't have a hedge obscuring his view and got a straight-on view of this woman hanging there. It's still hard for me to believe that the woman I saw staring at me out of my peripherals was dead the entire time. I do find it very sketchy that the husband came running out as soon as it was obvious that someone had discovered the body. That is a bit too convenient if you ask me but I don't want to say that this man killed his wife without any evidence. My brother was never followed up by the police, leading me to believe that the death was in fact her taking her own life. I just still can't fathom that if I would have turned to face this woman, I would have discovered her about 20 minutes earlier than my twin had, and it deeply troubles me that I didn't. For context, I'm a preschool teacher and was at work. I was outside on the playground with my kids for recess when I noticed someone staring at us over our gate. Our gate isn't a street view, but is rather long and steep. You need to walk about 20 feet down from the sidewalk to stand where he was. He was fidgety and acting strange, his face covered with what I assumed are scabs from meth use, which was common in this area. I asked him if I could help him pretending this was totally normal as to not risk escalating anything. He asked me for a pamphlet, which I didn't have, but I offered to write his information down and reach out, anything to get him to leave. He accepted, and I reached for my phone when he made a fast movement to unlock and enter the playground. I told him he needed to step away as my kids were out and I can't let him in without an appointment for a tour. He would said he'd do his tour now and continue trying. Still remaining calm and cheery to keep my kids calm who by now were taking notice, I told him we were full of appointments for today and he could come back another time. Well, uh, can I just play with them for a little while? He asked. I told him I cannot allow that and we were just about to go inside anyways and he stared at me with narrowed eyes. Without turning away, I told my kids we were having a fun race to the gate on the opposite side of the playground from him, and whoever won got a prize. They forgot about the strange man, and ran for that prize. The man seemed irritated with this, but backed down. I told him to have a nice day, and watched as he walked away looking into every window up the driveway as he did. I'm sitting in my class while my kids nap, thankful he didn't get into the playground and hurt them. Not the worst thing to happen, but definitely oddly terrifying. I'm going to file a police report to document it, in case it happens again, or worse. My wife and I travel often, city to city, and at one point we settled down in Vegas for a few months. There was one night we were arguing after work, headed towards Henderson, a city outside of Vegas, lots of isolated streets out that way. I was sitting reclined back in the passenger seat when we ran over something and the tire definitely popped. My wife got out to check and confirmed it. Within seconds, a woman in a very nice car pulls up behind us. 
I saw she was a woman and I laid back in the seat, still mad, still stubborn and figuring she was just checking on my wife assuming she was alone. The woman said she had a brother-in-law with a tow truck. He could definitely tow the car for free of charge to a shop. My wife asked why she was being so kind and she said something like, Us sisters gonna stick together. I'm helping you out. She then got back in the car and my wife told me she was going to follow us with her hazards on in this empty and dark parking lot in front of some grocery store nearby to get us out of the road. I still didn't think it was weird at all. My wife was very confident this woman was genuine and really wanted to help. So we pull into the parking lot and my wife got out. I'm still laying back. This woman doesn't even know I'm here yet. She starts talking to my wife about how she changed her life within a year. She could put her on to what she does. It seemed believable. She looked very nice and her car was definitely expensive. My wife keeps insisting she can just call a tow truck. She felt bad she was taking time from her. We could afford it. The woman kept insisting her brother-in-law was coming. To be patient, it really doesn't mind. She even offered at some point to drive my wife around the area looking for a shop that was open, but my wife had already googled some places. She told her that's smart and they kept talking. No suspicion, honestly. She then starts asking my wife why she's in Vegas. We had New York plates. She says for adventure and doing something new, blah blah blah. The woman asks if she has family, she's close to, or a boyfriend, and she could introduce her to some friends to help her get well acquainted or whatever. She motions over to me and says, Well, I have a husband. And the woman looked like a deer in the headlights. I politely waved. She leans over and finally sees me, stares for a few seconds, and immediately gets in her car. Instantly. I never saw someone look at me like that, like she had to get away from me. She tells my wife she has to go to a store that's opening soon. Her brother-in-law is taking too long, but he will be there in an hour at least. She told her not to leave. He'll come help. One hour, okay, honey? My wife was confused and tried to ask her if she'd be there too, but the woman just drove off. We knew then that something was wrong with that situation. We both just stared at each other in confusion. I have no idea still of why that happened. We called the towing company and fixed the car within 40 minutes, drove back to wait because my wife was persistent in believing the woman was going to come back or her brother-in-law would and she would have to let them know that she didn't need their help. I told her I don't think they're coming back, but we did wait. No one came for nearly two hours before we drove home. I did some research and found out a lot of traffickers use women because they seem more trustworthy. Vegas obviously has a large presence of these things as well. The woman was almost desperate to keep my wife there. It was all so weird. Now when I look back, it seems more obvious that there was danger there, but in the moment, the woman was so charming and endearing that it seemed like she was genuinely trying to help. I still don't know, but I'm pretty sure she ran off because I was there and she didn't anticipate a man to actually be there. This happened around 10 years ago now. I was around 13 to 14 and pretty small at the time. It was during the winter period, so at the time I was coming home from extracurricular activities, and it was already dark at around 6pm. I stepped out of the bus and had to still walk a 5 minute walk. However, the area we were living in wasn't the best and my older brother always told me to hold my keys in my hand, ready to protect myself. Three keys between my fingers, like I'd be Wolverine or something like that. I saw a guy walk toward me, but he didn't really raise any red flags, just a dude walking home. He didn't look at me or sped up when he saw me, really nothing. After he passed me though, he grabbed me by my jacket and threw me on the floor. He was quite a big dude while I could compare my weight to an oversized chicken. The dude started kicking me and punching me and after the initial shock, I did the only thing that came to my head. I pulled the keys out of my pocket and stabbed him with all my strength in his thigh. One key right in. He screamed in pain and fell to the ground and I used this opportunity to get out of there. 
After two minutes of sprinting, I was home, bleeding from my face and crying, and I told my parents everything. We went back to where he had grabbed me, but there was only some blood on the floor and no sign of him. We reported the incident to the police and never heard anything back from them. My parents decided to buy me a pocket knife after that, and my older brother got me a better one, which I still have, and is pretty cool. Me and my mother were driving through our small town in southwest Virginia. My mother and father are divorced, and he lives in Tennessee. They had very different viewpoints on helping out hitchhikers, as... My dad was very much into hiking, camping, etc., but there was a woman walking down the road. Mind you, it's very hot outside, it's the summertime, and I noticed she was carrying a child swaddled up in a blanket, which struck me as a poor choice considering it was the middle of summer. It just seems too warm for a swaddle. So I say to my mom, we really need to pick that lady up. Surely she isn't far from where she needs to go, but she's got a baby. And to my surprise... My mom pulls into the gas station parking lot, tells me to go in and get a large bottle of water, and we'll ask her if she'd like a ride. So, we pull out of the gas station and approach the thin, almost sickly-looking woman, and she very quietly just grabbed the door handle and got inside. Not saying anything at all, not even a thank you, which really didn't sit right with me because this is the South. Everyone is friendly and approachable, for the most part. So... We ask where she's needing to go, and me being in the passenger seat, I turn to look at her, and she's looking down at her, baby, and cooing at it. She replies without ever looking up from the swaddle, being about two miles past the Dollar General and Jeb Stewart, and we were very close to that area. I decided to turn and speak to the woman, maybe get a conversation going, but as I get a better look at her, baby, it actually was a drywall hammer wrapped up in a blanket, inside another blanket. I froze. It was like I walked into a deep freezer. I told my mom that I really think we should stop because I hear what sounds like knocking and was very adamant. We needed to stop at the upcoming Dollar General. As we pull in, I told my mom to get out of the car that I needed her help to locate the noise and we met each other at the hood of the car where I told her, Mom, that's not a baby. She's got a hammer in that blanket. To which my mother advised me that we should walk inside to see if they had anything to help close that up. And told the woman we would be right back. We walked inside and told them to call the police so they could help this woman that we could no longer have in our vehicle and explained why. My mother gave her some vague reason as to why we couldn't take her further and she got out of the vehicle very angrily but almost confused and we left her in that parking lot. She very well could have just been a really confused woman, maybe with some mental issues, but I don't know what was going on with her, but I do know that I don't think she had good intentions for us. When I was 16... I had just gotten my first car and had it about three weeks. This guy walks up to me at a gas station and asks to use my phone. Naive and trying to be nice, I let him use it. But he walks away for a minute and then walks back with an older guy. I didn't know at the time, but he had taken the SIM card out of my phone. Then they get into the back seat of my car. A friend of mine was in the front and they ask if I will give them a ride up the street. At this point, I was kind of nervous and just wanted them gone, so I thought this would get rid of them. It was literally like a minute drive down to this bar, so I figured, okay, let me just do whatever they want and get them gone. They were kind of intimidating, especially to a 16-year-old me. But as I started to drive, he says, take this right and go down this road which happened to be the road I live on. So I thought, cool, I'll drop them off and be right back home. Well, I get to the house he wanted to go to, but then another guy, a thugged guy, 
gets into my car. He was really intimidating. And they say, take us to Wendy's and bring us back. It was like five minutes away, so I figured I would get them their Wendy's and that would be it. So I take them through the drive through get food, and start to head back to my house. But he says no, take us up the street. At this point, I tell them, is this it? I need to be getting home. And he's like, yeah, just drop us off. It's like five minutes away. Still haven't gotten my phone back, by the way. Too scared to ask at this point. That's the least of my worries, really. So I drive to get to this dirt road. Really freaking out now. We come to an area surrounded by trees. Kind of a big circle. Big enough to turn around. So I start to turn around because there is no house. And at that point, he reached up from the back seat and throws my car in park and grabs me. My friend jumps out and tries to run. One of the other guys gets out and hits him, but I guess he got away. It was dark and hard to see. Then he pulls out a gun and tells me to get out. I'm scared, like really scared, thinking I'm about to die. He hits me in the mouth with the gun and tells me to give him everything. I had some money in my pocket and I hand it to him. They all get into the car and drove off. I'm miles away from anywhere and start walking. No phone, freaking out. I called out my friend's name and hear nothing. I walked a few miles to the gas station and cops are there. I guess my friend made it there and called. And I called my dad and told him what happened. It was the scariest moment of my life and I should be dead. My face was all busted up and we go to the police station. We tell them everything. They think we were buying drugs from these guys and are trying to get me to tell them who it was. Then, they pull out a book of pictures. After like 30 minutes, I see the one who hit me. I knew it was him instantly and told them. A couple of weeks later, I hear that he had stolen another car, got pulled over, ends up stealing the cop car, then is chased down. He gets out, tries to cut across a train track with a train coming, and falls, and it severs his legs. Justice was served. But it doesn't end there. Years later, I saw him at a bar, with crutches hobbling around. Then, a couple of years after that, he got hit by a car one night and was killed. I should be dead, but he is. So, to the guy who almost killed me, I know we will never meet. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, Kilimanjaro rises like Olympus above the Serengeti. <laughs>